it's always a special treat for us to be able to showcase some of our, um, our own team here at the John Locke Foundation, and that is the case today. Delighted to be able to hear from our own John Sanders, who is Director of Regulatory Studies. If you read John's work at carolinajournal.com or johnlock.org, you know that he is an expert in many areas of, of regulation. Um, he has come to become he has come to be an expert on the issue of occupational licensing. In fact, uh, he's been invited, I believe, it was by the state of Kansas, invited him to come and testify before their version of um, our General Assembly about Kansas and how they do things there. So there is this big question now about um, barriers to entry in North Carolina imposed by um, state law that kind of prevent some people from practicing their particular trade or skill because of the uh, fees and uh, licensing requirements that are in place. And it's a really good discussion that we're starting to have to see if there are some of those areas where we could scale back that licensing in order to free up more opportunity for people to earn a living and support themselves. John has been at the forefront, forefront of a lot of that research and writing. He's joining us today to give us an update on what it could mean for North Carolina. Please welcome John Sanders. Okay, let's see if I've got this set up. All right, I can hear me, so I assume y'all can. Um, I liked Donna's leading with the tax reform issue. Um, my work is in regulatory policy. Uh, that is kind of a hidden reform. Um, taxes, um, your tax rates, etc. Those are kind of visible. I, obviously, your when you receive your tax bill, that's a visible thing. Regulatory policy is sort of a hidden thing in the state's economy. It's not something that, that's actually, you know, something tangible um, when it regards the eco economy of the state. However, it's very important. In fact, uh, studies over the last 25 years of regulatory change versus tax changes show that there are actually changes to regula regulatory policies actually um, more likely to impact the state's economy than changes in, in taxes. So it's very important, but it goes kind of under the radar. Um, I'm going to speak today on occupational licensing. Uh, make sure I got this clicker right. Here we go, Mitch. And there we go. Fumbled right out of the bag. There we go. Um, labor is a very special right in North Carolina. I'm quoting here from uh, Article 1, Section 1 in the North Carolina Constitution. We hold it to be self-evident that all persons are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. This language probably sounds familiar to you at this point, right? Um, that among these are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruits of their own labor, and the pursuit of happiness. I bolded the addition. There are two things that's important about this to me. One, while that language is lifted from the Declaration of Independence, it is put in our state constitution. And two, we add the enjoyment of the fruits of their own labor. And I say this is a, a special right because it's regarded as a self-evident right. This means it's something that is just obvious, plain, captain obvious. You can see it and it's clear. Uh, so I think that's a very important thing to lead with. We hold that it is a self-evident right that people in North Carolina are entitled to the enjoyment of the fruits of their own labor. All right, so Licensing has been at the forefront in North Carolina. Um, you may know that last week a um, subcommittee has tabled some language that would, may have led to the, the ending of some licensing boards in North Carolina and some other consolidations. Um, furthermore, the Program Evaluation Division, this is one of the reasons why this was brought before the legislature, they had a report in 2014 that uh, identified 55 occupational licensing agencies, found that there was some insufficient oversight, made some recommendations for reviewing 12 agencies and for consolidating 10. That same year, the state auditor had its own report. They identified 57 boards. Um, one of the things that they said was the official listing of boards is incomplete. I will say as a researcher that it's very hard to find 
what are licensed and what's not, and what are the actual licensing boards going through through the state. So I was actually kind of gratified to see that the auditor was having the same problem. Um, and more importantly, the Supreme Court ruled in February of 2015 on the uh, Board of Dental, State Board of Dental Examiners regarding teeth whitening services. They found that they had violated antitrust laws in trying to make teeth whitening, which is a service that you can get at the mall sometimes for $75, to be the exclusive province of licensed dentists, which is something you would have to pay them maybe $400 to $1,400 for that service. So what is an occupational license? It is basically the receipt of official permission from the government for you to engage in the work that you want to do. And it's costly in several ways. Um, one, in order to get this, you've got to satisfy educational credits, which means that you've got to, um, you've got to go to school, you've got to pay for school, uh, you've got to log in the time and the study hours, and, and sometimes it also requires you to log job experience. Um, you have to pass any required fee exams, and exams also include sitting fees. And then you pay license and renewal fees. The effects of licensing that um, economists have found is, let me, there we go. The, when hurdles are not in place, when I say hurdles, I mean the time spent going to school, the, the, the money, um, paid the, the exam fees and all of that. Um, when those hurdles are not in place for a particular industry, for a particular field of labor, um, employment grows faster. Um, about 20% faster in states for an industry that's not subject to licensure as compared with states where it is. Um, it keeps, licensing keeps the supply of labor low um, in the regulated field and keeps it from growing as fast as it would otherwise grow. These burdens that I mentioned are especially harmful. Man, I'm terrible at this, Mitch. There we go. I think I have to hold the button down a little bit harder. Are especially burdensome on the poor, as one would expect. Um, not only is it harder for the poor to come up with the kind of fees and the money that, that's necessary, but there's also time if, if for example, it's a woman who wants to go back into the workforce. She may have to look into getting babysitters or rearranging her time in, in those ways. So uh, the Institute for Justice had this wonderful report in 2012 that looked at licensing burdens, especially on the poor. And they looked at 102 um, fields that broke down that were mostly um, low income licenses. So as they say, it's especially burden for low income workers. And it's not just for poor individuals, but there's also people who decided to go back to work later in life, or maybe they've been laid off and decide they're gonna go choose a different profession. Um, they, these are hurdles that, that are placed before them. Putting hurdles before the poor to prevent them from work and entrepreneurship also is a burden on the society at large. It's not just a burden that, we, that affects a small subset of people, but in consequence, it ends up affecting society at large. Um, discouraging low-income workers from new jobs and also from independent business possibilities, from being um, deciding to, to be a hairdresser or a barber or to, to go into business for themselves as a general um, laborer, um, carpenter, whatever. Um, it harms their economic stability and their self-sufficiency. They may earn less over their lifetime because they have to take a, a lower job than the one that perhaps they want. Um, it also prevents them from using what may be their most productive resource available to them. I've already talked about the Constitution. I'm gonna to go to Adam Smith because I'm an economist. Um, in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith points out the patrimony of a poor man lies in the strength and dexterity of his hands. And to hinder him from employing this strength and dexterity in what manner he thinks proper without injury to his neighbor is a plain violation of this most sacred property. So for me, I see the ability to work. I agree with Adam Smith. It's your most sacred property. And I agree with the state constitution of North Carolina that this is a self-evident right. So I'm a big fan of entrepreneurship. 
allowing low-income workers greater avenues to entrepreneurship is particularly helpful in low-income areas. Why is that? It's not only that it offers individuals a ladder out of poverty through their own work, but in poor communities, there usually aren't those other, those other things, the, the um, you know, the, the other jobs, the availability of other entrepreneurs coming in. So um, as the Fed Reserve, this Federal Reserve economist, Kelly Edmondson points out, entrepreneurship in low-income areas may yield a double dividend. Many retail and service establishments available in higher-income areas, such as grocery stores, are not available in low- and moderate-income people. And they also face transportational challenges. So bringing in more entrepreneurship possibilities, allowing uh, job creation to take place in lower-income areas, which is stymied through, li through licensing, can provide income and some of these other activities to, to accrue these goods and services to accrue to the low-income areas. <coughs> the issue with licensing, as most people see it, is safety and quality. Uh, that's normally the, uh, the reason for a new license to be established is the state needs to get involved because we have concerns about consumer safety and quality of service provided. However, when academic researchers look into it, the most consistent finding they have is that it boosts the earnings of those who are in the regulated field. The findings regarding safety and quality are pretty mixed and actually not very um, conducive to the idea that licensing helps with safety and quality. I'll get back to that in a little bit, why that is. However, the most generally held view on economics is that it boosts, uh, it restricts the supply of labor, and those who know Econ 101 will know what that means. And so it therefore drives up the price of labor as well as the price of services rendered, which means that another effect is that it's raising the cost on people to engage in, to, to purchase these services. This leads to what economists call, who study this, call the earnings premium. Um, of licensing for service providers. If you are in a licensed activity, you generally earn 15% or more lifetime uh, than you would have if the activity was not licensed, um, than what you normally would have if you were facing an open field of competition. The more lucrative the field is, the generally the, uh, the higher percentage-wise the earnings premium is. So this has consequences for jobs and for consumers. Um, restricting the supply of labor restricts the supply of, it re also results in fewer jobs. Um, according to the uh, Obama administration's white paper that came out last year, and it's a very good paper, um, believe it or not, uh, they, uh, they did a very good job on this. Um, they, have, they have some good economists who have been working in this field that came into the administration. So uh, this is, um, I think it's a, a very important paper. Uh, but they pointed out licensing restrictions by one estimation cost millions of jobs nationwide and raise consumer expenses by over a hundred billion dollars. That's pretty significant. And those have significant effects on the economy. And this is nationally, not in our state economy. Why doesn't licensing have a big effect on safety and quality? Shouldn't it? Well, one reason is the difference between how economists and how state policymakers measure safety and quality. It well could be that licensing raises the quality of service provided by licensed professionals. But there's still some questions about that depending on the kind of standards that the boards input. However, the level of service received is where the difference lies. If you raise the prices, as an economist could tell you, that people are going to seek alternatives. People seek service alternatives when licensing raises prices on them. Those could be just deciding not to do the necessary work. 
uh, which means you're taking on a greater risk. And you could have a risk of failure if you haven't done, you know, it depends on the kind of work. Um, doing it yourself. So I'm thinking about maybe home repairs, for example, going and doing things, doing your own electricity, for example. Uh, maybe you do a good job of that. Maybe you really screw it up. Um, having a friend or family member do it. Paying for work under the table. Finding a fly-by-night provider. Um, I know I did this when I was, um, and not long after we moved into a house, there was a guy coming by side, paving driveways and we wanted our driveway paved. And, we had our driveway paved. It wasn't until later we realized the, the kind of shortcuts that he took, including not spraying weeds. We had weeds growing up in the middle of our driveway that we had to take care of. Learn things the hard way. Um, and get taken by a scam provider. These are all alternatives that people will take uh, when they don't want to pay the price of the service because it's been artificially raised by licensure. So revisiting the issue of safety and quality. So, that's the difference between stated outcome measures and actual outcome measures. So this is why research literature on licensing is inconclusive and also not very favorable. Um, Counterintuitive findings are include, for example, electricity. Um, there are greater electrocution rates in states that have stricter licensing laws for electricity. That would seem counterintuitive except for the fact that you have to also realize the higher prices for the limited supply of electricians leads to people choosing non-electricians. Um, higher rates of blindness in states with tougher optometry licensing laws. Um, greater rates of poor dental hygiene determining um, with states with stricter dental licensing laws. There was some um, research from the 80s that found a greater risk of rabies on on state, in states where restrictions on veterinarians made it so that there were fewer people who were able to detect rabies outbreaks. Now how are we in North Carolina? North Carolina is more restrictive than most states, especially in the region, with regards to occupational licensing. So we license more than most states. And especially, we license about three times more than the state of South Carolina. Um, I list several different reports. Summers was from Reason, um, found North Carolina to be tied for the 12th most res restrictive state. Um, Schlomach uh, was reporting for Goldwater, and uh, he, he had us tied for 15th most restrictive. Reason being, it's very difficult to, to compare states across states because of the way that they do individual licenses. Some states, for example, will have a general um, construction worker license some states will divide it up into different aspects of construction, drywall, um, carpentry, masonry. So it, it's hard for researchers to com make comparisons across states because of differences like that. And so there will be these kind of, you know, if you look at it, why is it different? Um, Career One Stop, which is the government um, system, has a, with an unadjusted count, um, 30th. Uh, Mercatus has us 39th most free, which means we're 11th least. Um, and the Institute for Justice has us tied for 17th most restrictive of licensing, of, li of occupations for primarily lower income workers. And in the White House report I mentioned earlier, 22% uh, of North Carolina's workforce is licensed by the state, which is 22nd high. So it's about the middle of the pack there. The Institute for Justice report that I mentioned found that six out of the 48 lower income occupations that North Carolina licenses are licensed in fewer than half of U.S. states. A landscape contractor, only 10 states in the nation license that. Optician, 22 states. Sign language interpreter, 16 states. Crane operator, 18 states. Locksmith, only 13 states. Weyers, 24 states. How we compare with our neighbors. Uh, you can see South Carolina at the, board of, at, at the bottom. This is a Shlomox report. Um, has it at 49, whereas North Carolina is at 154. Um, we're less than Tennessee, so uh, take that for what it's worth. 
Uh, as far as lower income occupations, we're about middle of the pack. So I suppose that's not too bad. North Carolina's history and licensing. Um, I thought this was interesting in Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, his chapter on occupation and licensing, he highlighted some special research that said as long ago as 1938, a single state, North Carolina, had extended its law to 60 occupations. So even then, we were already licensing 60 occupations. Licensing has grown tremendously in North Carolina. I have uh, the number of licensing boards, which is different from licensing um, professions. The number of licensing boards at the end of the 1970s was 30. And then over the next few decades, we continued to add. And I noted this at the bottom. My count is short by two boards, according to uh, the auditor's report. So I haven't actually gone back and tried to figure out which two I'm missing. This chart was in the Administrative Procedures Oversight Committee last month um, in hearing on occupational licensing boards. It shows the growth of uh, occupational licensing had had us at the halfway point in 1973, we had a lower slope, which means it wasn't growing quite as fast until here. And then suddenly it started growing a lot faster. So not only are we continuing to add boards, but in recent history, we've been adding them a lot faster. If we have concerns about safety and quality, and there can be, uh, but licensing is not the only way of addressing it. It is, however, the most restrictive way of addressing it. And that's because it takes away, it puts a significant hurdle in front of someone exercising their self-evident right to the enjoyment of their own labor. So licensing is a denial of individuals' legal opportunity to work. And it's done there, uh, this is from the PED report, it's most often used when there's a significant risk of harm to the public. Well, how do we define what's significant? There's a great difference. Ooh, something happened with that. That slide's messed up, sorry. Um, what that slide is supposed to say is that there's a significant difference in the states among um, what's licensed. Uh, basically, all the professions that are licensed in at least one of the 50 states, there are over 1,100 different professions. However, only about 60 or less than 6% are licensed in all of them, which means that there is a significant disagreement among the 50 states as to what rises to the level of dangerous and significant and needing state licensure. Um, similarly, of the 102 lower income occupations identified by the Institute of Justice, only 15 are licensed in 40 states or more. Again, significant difference. This is why I like to pr promote voluntary certification over licensing. Voluntary certification, we're seeking out a third party, a creditor or certifier to show to potential consumers that you know what you're doing that you are competent professional. I like that as opposed to having to go to the state and jump through all the state hurdles as a way of entering your profession. Certification requires you to prove to a third party that you're competent, but it doesn't prohibit you from entering the field. It prohibits you from claiming a certification. That would be fraudulent practice if you were to claim a certification and it would be actionable by the state. Voluntary certification in action. There are several uh, well-known names such as Underwriters Laboratories, Good Housekeeping, Better Business Bureau, and so forth that will do private uh, certification for services. Um, for example, automotive services. There are over 300,000 mechanics that are certified by the National Institute for Automotive Services. Um, locksmiths have their own, um, with over 4,000 been certified by the Associated Locksmiths of America, and then there's almost 3,000 undergoing uh, certification. 
couple of years ago, a behavioral analyst sought to get licensure in North Carolina. There is already a private board that offers training and certification. One of the things I found was interesting is that there's even certification for certification programs. Uh, if you are a private certification program, you can go to a third party accrediting organization such as the National Organization of Competency Assurance or the American National Standards Institute. So even your certifying board can be certified. I'm not going to go through all of this. This chart um, is in my paper from uh, last summer comparing voluntary licensing and certification. I go through, this is a two-part table, is why I said I'm just not going to read all of that. Um, spare you a little bit. I want to get to the safety and po quality policy pyramid. This is a really interesting teaching tool used by the Institute for Justice. I think it's very important. Um, it's, it's an inverted because it's going from most important to most restrictive. So the most free to most restrictive aspects of, of approaching it. And to use the policy pyramid, start with the idea that market competition with private litigation is your default position. Um, start with freedom. Don't start with the most restrictive aspect of licensing. If the state policymakers have a concern of fraud, if they're worried about fraud, then you strengthen the Deceptive Trade Practices Acts and you give the Attorney General power to go after and, and you, you strengthen more consumer protections. That's your legal aspect if you're worried about fraud. If you're worried about cleanliness, then you just require inspections or you require stronger inspections. What if you're worried about externalities? If you're worried about third party, her, third party harms, um, then you require bonding or insurance. None of these things restrict someone's, um, none of these require state licensure, um, state hoops in order to enter your field of business. If you're worried about fly-by-night com companies coming in, especially in, uh, like roofers coming in after a, a natural disaster and, and, and some people being taken advantage of it. Um, or, you know, people like me <laughs> getting a, a bad uh, driveway paver. Then you have a registration with the Attorney General. Just, just a little hoop just to, you know, to say that they are legitimate. It doesn't prevent them from doing work. Um, if you're worried about asymmetrical information, which would be such things as mechanics, for example, um, medical companies, anything where you are, as a consumer, not very wise on the intricacies of the service that you need and you could be taken advantage of, um, or sometimes there can be insurance reimbursement reasons, uh, then you worry about, then you go through certification. Only in the most extreme examples, in the most extreme safety quality concerns, would you go for licensing. So my recommendations, and I start with, I want to uphold North Carolinians', North Carolinians self-evident right to the enjoyment of the fruit of their labor. Promote voluntary servicing over licensing, when, certification over licensing whenever possible. Um, so realize that the significant risk of harm to the public, as stated in the PED report, is a very high standard. It's not just words. This is a very high standard to make. Um, so reserve it for actually truly significant risks of harm. A few uh, years ago when I was studying licensing, I came across, there was one state, and I wish I could remember where I found this. It was buried in one of the reports that I was reading but a state was considering whether they should have interior designers licensed. And the interior designers prepared a presentation for legislators where they had a baby doll crawl in and contact some poorly hung drapes. And eventually the drapes fell, harmed the baby, and caught fire. 
this is the sort of thing that they were using to sell the idea that interior design was a significant risk of harm to the public. The other thing I like about interior design was that when the Obama administration came in, the uh, Obama family, when they moved into the White House, they went and hired their own interior designers outside of DC, even though they are licensed in the District of Columbia. Ensure that state law adequately punishes fraudulent claims of certification so that there's, you know, there's teeth to it if we're going to have certification. Um, encourage certification and also promote public awareness to seek out certified providers. But also trust people to know their own needs. You may have a small item that needs fixing. Um, you may have a small service need and you don't need to go to, in, in your mind, you don't need to go to someone who is, who's got a whole list of letters past their name saying how many certifications that they've won. Um, you just need someone who can come in and take care of the problem. So trust people. Secondly, choose to allow more occupational freedom in North Carolina. I would say to policymakers right now, as um, this is an issue before the General Assembly this year and beyond, subject licensing boards to sunset with periodic review. Sunset provisions with periodic review have been very successful so far since they were passed in 2013 um, for regulations. I think it's a very good reform that we should apply to licensing boards. Uh, things change. Um, the, uh, the dental case, for example, um, when the dental board was, was originally past, teeth whitening services weren't exactly what they are now, if they were anything. I'm not an expert on teeth whitening. Uh, I saw last week that someone used 3D printer to fix his own teeth, to, to align his own teeth. Uh, I think that is an idea that may uh, pose problems to licensing boards in, in the future. Um, it's, it's a technological innovation that no one would have foreseen just five years ago, I think. Um, so, sunsetting and um, periodically reviewing these boards, I think, makes sense as these things will continue to change. Um, eliminate questionable boards and licenses. I think that just makes, makes sense. Of course, no board considers themselves questionable, but I think that um, being able to review will lead to finding those. One way of going about it may be setting a numeric goal, an effective date. And I put up two suggestions. So, for example, by 2021, have the same number of licensed occupations as South Carolina, which is the most free state in our region. Or move one third of licensed occupations by certification by 2020. Um, some sort of approach like that that gives everybody a focus, that gives all policymakers and regulatory agencies a focus of where to move. And if possible, work with the boards to find their own questionable licenses. It may be that, especially in, in conjunction with the numeric goal and effective date, if they know that this is where we're going to go, um, instead of being a top-down driven proposal, work with them to help achieve a goal that's set by state policymakers. That might be a good way of going about it. After the sunset provisions, apply strong sunrise provisions against proposed new boards. Actually, not afterwards. I would say in conjunction with or even in lieu of. Um, have strong sunrise provisions for new boards. Um, what I mean by sunrise is don't make it where you can just start a board willy-nilly. Make it where state policymakers have um, metrics to meet in order to justify putting a new occupation in North Carolina under licensure. So have them uh, provide actionable evidence that the occupation without state regulation is a threat uh, to public health, safety, or welfare. 